Yeah, cool. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hey, maybe just as context, just because I think this is the first one we're doing here. Um, some history, uh, Josh Hannon and myself, and then um, last year, and then this year, Chris, Matt, and myself uh, put together uh, first a physical road trip to the Bay Area, and then this year with Shelter in Place, a virtual road trip to the Bay Area. And um, it was just a great experience. Um, it was a, a really neat way of um, investor fellows like myself in the Bay Area to connect and try and add value to um, New Zealand-based entrepreneurs and, and investors. And, and, um, and through the process, was able to meet some really cool uh, companies and really cool entrepreneurs. And, and so uh, with, the, with the advent of Shelter in Place, with the use of Zoom, we're like, well, why do this, you know, uh, you know two big day sessions once a year, let's try and do this more frequently and, and thereby um, try to increase the connectivity between um, investor fellows and probably entrepreneur fellows over time and the New Zealand community. So um, Michelle and I came up with this idea of a, of a monthly, um, essentially interview series. Um, and so the idea is for one fellow to interview another fellow. So I'm gonna interview uh, Chris uh, today, um, just so that you get to know Chris in a little bit more detail and um, probably go for like 20, 30 minutes of prepared questions and then open it up to, um, to uh, you know, questions from the group. So. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe before we kick it off, if, if we could do this super quick, just so just to be fair to Chris and so he understands the audience and who who all um, is uh, is is logged in here and, and gets a sense of how to how to um, to address the audience. If, if we could go around really quickly, I think there's roughly twenty ish um, folks who are dialed in. Um, if you could just really quickly say like, "Hey, I'm from." I'm from Auckland, as an example. I, I run a small early stage company, X, and, and then we can just go through it really quickly. So Chris has a sense of maybe some perspectives you all, you all might be interested in. So just, maybe Mike, yes. if you could kick it off. Yeah, just make it really quick. I'm just conscious with that many people in there, this will take over 20 minutes. Yeah, may, maybe a half a minute each or, or maybe less if we could just go, just barrel through it. Mike, do you mind kicking this off? Well, hey guys, Mike Hanna from NZTE Investment, um, angel investor from Auckland as well. Hey, Kyle Webster, I think you're next. Cool. Hi, um, I'm Kyle. I'm a Wellington-based founder um, and I run a small company called LitMaps that builds uh, search and navigation software for scientific literature. Cool. Uh, Roland? Hi, I'm Roland Sommer. Day job is general manager of uh, Tyco Electronics in Christchurch, New Zealand. And vocational job is with uh, Aerospace Christchurch, where we're looking to set up a uh, aerospace hub. Cool. Brooke? Uh, Brooke, I think you're next. Uh, Brooke Bonner, I am in Bellevue, Idaho, hoping to move to New Zealand very soon. And I currently work with an organization called the Impact Finance Center, where we do philanthropist and investor education to connect their values and their dollars. Cool. Sean, I think you're next. Uh, <clears throat> Sean McGrail, I'm from uh, Boston, Mass. I'm a recovering entrepreneur um, and a, currently an angel investor um, focused in on female-led businesses. Cool. Adele, if I if I have that right. Hey guys, I am Adele. Uh, I run a little technical agency in Auckland. Uh, we focus on e-commerce, but to identify gaps while providing services uh, on um, a couple of SaaS products around payments and clouds and integration. Cool. And, and that Matt Thompson. Uh. Kia ora tato, Max Thompson uh, from Callahan Innovation. I work with our uh, startup programs uh, across New Zealand. Cool. Um, Nelson? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm connected from Chile, South America. Uh, I have a company that we provide a financial solution for small companies. Cool. Aaron, I think you're next. Aaron, Paul, and Scott. I think we're pretty close, so just trying to get through this. Uh, Aaron, I'm an entrepreneur and angel investor focused on like B2B SaaS. Cool. Hey, Paul, I think you're on mute. 
as always. <laughs> uh, Paul Spence uh, from Christchurch, currently a mentor and uh, program support at Think Lab, the incubator attached to Canterbury University. Very cool. That's Scott. Scott Cabot, I'm in the Bay Area. I'm a former consumer CMO who's uh, running an advisory business, 621 Consulting, that helps startups with marketing and go-to-market needs. Cool. Uh, Mark? <clears throat> I'm based also in the Bay Area, just north of San Francisco. Um, I'm launching an early stage fund to invest in New Zealand startups that are coming to the US market. Awesome. Hey, Ed, how's it going? Hey, Dave. I'm Ed Baker, live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, ran international growth at Facebook and then started the growth team at Uber and now do angel investing. Cool. Christy? Uh, Kirsty, sorry. Hi, I'm Kirsty Reynolds. I'm an angel investor. I sit on the board of the Ice Angels and I'm really passionate and working on how we can provide access to patient capital for our export growth focused SMEs. So that's me. Cool. Uh, Annie? Hello, beloved. Kia ora kato. Um, my name's Annie, as you know. I'm co-founder of a number of for-purpose businesses based in Auckland. Uh, and we're really uh, a coach governance and executive leadership and also convene movements of change to reduce inequities for Māori and Pacifica people in Aotearoa. Cool. Uh, Yuri? I'm Uri Lopatton. I was a biotech entrepreneur, and then I was a visiting partner at Y Combinator. And most recently, I'm a biotech founder, again, founded Cardace Biosciences, making oral antivirals for things like COVID. I think Tamiflu, but for coronavirus. Very cool. Um, Neil? I think we might have some folks that, um, that have stepped away. Uh, maybe Anita is next. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm in Auckland. I'm coming from the corporate world originally, and I'm an independent director now, uh, as well as an investor and part of the Huddles team. Cool. All right. I think that's everybody that's on video. So I appreciate it. I know that, that took some time, but um, my hope is part of this is uh, it, it's hopefully a conduit for you all to, to meet each other. So um, Perhaps that's a way of uh, flagging people that you want to connect with offline. All right, with, with that, um, maybe we can get into uh, to Chris. Um, so uh, I think the goal of this, Chris, is to, to talk through um, uh, your interest as an investor, um, kind of your worldview, and maybe how you connect to New Zealand. But, but before we uh, get into that, it'd be awesome just to hear about you as a person. So, you know, ready to grow up, tell us about your family, tell us about Chris kind of before you became an investor. This is like the half of my career that I usually skim over uh, or don't talk about at all. Uh, so I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, uh, grew up there and then uh, ended up moving to the Chicago area. I went to school at Northwestern. Uh, then uh, first, I don't know, I guess job out of school was actually selling uh, enterprise IT solutions uh, to a lot of early stage corporates and folks that I found in Fast Company at the time. I think it was right around the time that Fast Company started uh, publishing uh, its magazines. And so I used their hot lists as a way to kind of sell into hot startups and ended up connecting with a lot of companies that have then gone on to do some amazing things. But uh, that was kind of my first foray, I guess, into Silicon Valley and uh, more tech focused innovation. I grew up in a family of uh, entrepreneurs. So it was always kind of uh, thinking about different ways to start businesses and things like that. But this was kind of the first foray into to some of what was going on on the tech side. Yeah. And, and what specifically got you into VC? Like, was there, was there an experience? Was there a relationship? <laughs> or like, how'd you, how'd you get into this job that isn't quite a job? So uh, I'm an accidental venture capitalist. Uh, so this is more of the part of the story that I'm usually comfortable with. Uh, I'm a long time operator, first time fund manager. So uh, depending on how far back you go, I started a couple companies, sold one for enough to cover a pizza and I think our AWS expenses, uh, I hope. And then uh, I somehow ended up as first employee and COO at a company building and launching small satellites. So literally shoebox size satellites, CubeSats. 
uh, and saw that from zero to space in 12 months with three satellites and then 65 over the following two and a half years. Uh, personally, got to touch every part of the business from uh, booking rockets with SpaceX and Rocket Labs and Roscosmos and JAXA and all the others uh, to traveling the world with an RF test kit to figure out where we drop our ground stations. Uh, I got some unique stories about TSA equivalent stops in various countries uh, when you're carrying around the RF test kit with you. Uh, and then left that, spent a couple of years as a drop-in COO at a couple different kind of frontier ventures, everything from autonomous vehicles to robotics to more space tech to some computer vision platforms. And then uh, spent a year at Costa Noa Ventures out of the Bay Area as an EIR, uh, where I thought it would be a forcing function to start my next company. Uh, and then lo and behold, my wife and I found out we were expecting our first child decided no better time to move to a more crowded populated city. So we moved to New York. And then when I got to New York, I uh, kind of found that the type of fund I would want to work with at the earliest stages didn't really exist here. And so I started a typical to be the kind of fund that I would want to actually work with. And so that's kind of the genesis. And, and you decided to create your own fund rather than go, go join a fund. To, tell me a little bit about yep. that. That's a little... Atypical. Yeah, so uh, so I met a number of the funds in and around New York and then uh, obviously had a lot of connections to Bay Area funds. Um, and through that process, I kind of saw that the market was shifting up. So funds were getting larger. The stage that they were tending to invest in was getting a little bit later and or the round sizes were getting larger. And I felt like there was a bit of a gap at the early stages, so almost like institutionalizing angel investing. Uh, which I'd done some of, but I didn't have a ton of capital. So I'm still what you'd consider network rich and liquidity poor. Uh, so I was writing small checks and I figured that there was no better way to kind of get additional leverage than to start a fund where I could actually pool capital together, give people access to some of those truly early stage innovations where at least in the deep tech side, you tend to see your largest accrual of value going into the seed round and then going into kind of like series C almost, those are tend to be the biggest bumps in valuation that you see. Uh, so being an angel investor in those deals can be very lucrative if you pick the right deals. Uh, and so for me, it was kind of a question of what's on market and what do I think the right opportunity is? And so I had a lot of entrepreneurs kind of reaching out, looking for access to capital, access to advice, and it just kind of happened, I suppose. That's great. And, and, and the name of the fund is Atypical. And you've talked a little bit about, you've given some, some hooks into what things you look for in terms of deep tech and, and stage, but, but uh, maybe flush it out a little bit. So just so um, people understand your context and your view. Yeah. yeah. So I tend to, there are a couple of different ways I describe it, depending on the audience. I've thrown out plausible science fiction. So if you come across something that looks like plausible science fiction, think Atypical. Uh, in reality, what I end up doing is I end up investing in high EQ engineers that are building primitives or foundational technologies. Uh, so I look for folks that are pre-product market fit, have some technical innovation in hand, uh, and are looking for almost a thought partner to help them work through that process of customer development, market discovery, uh, and getting to product market fit, and then can act as a bit of a gateway for uh, leverage around operations and how you actually get to scale and then obviously downstream investors and connecting with the right folks that like to back moonshots once they have a little bit of the proof points around customers and market. So where you're engaging it, and, and I think this might be useful um, to both startups and other investors, but just, just to understand your thinking that where you're engaging is really a bet on the team, right? That it tends to be, investors tend to be uh, team investors or yep. market investors, um, and sometimes a combination of the two, but it sounds like it's mainly team. Is that? Is that yeah, I actually, uh, so I'm prepping for my first uh, LP meeting tomorrow. So I've been thinking about this a lot. And uh, in my mind and kind of the frame for a typical uh, founder technology fit is the new product market fit. So for me, it's finding the right technical founder with the right kind of set of what I classify as high Q. So balance of IQ, EQ, and AQ. IQ being just raw technical ability. Is this person one of the top 100 people in the world to solve this particular challenge? EQ being their ability to work with others and also take uh, critical feedback 
because at the end of the day, you're not an expert in everything, no matter how smart you think you are. Uh, so being able to kind of work with your investors and partner with me in a way is impactful. Uh, and also I believe that EQ is, um, you can use a couple of things as a proxy to evaluate EQ. So looking at how a founder actually talks to their potential customers or does some of the market discovery. I love to put a founder onto a phone call with a potential customer of the innovation and see how they pitch it, uh, how they kind of convey that story and then how they respond to feedback or questions or so forth. Uh, and then AQ is essentially rock grit. So can this person take adversity, all the punches that come along with being a founder and then come out the other side stronger. Um, really, I'm looking for people that just can't quit. They can't turn it off. Yeah. Hey, Chris, let's let's um, let's spend a little time on each of those because I think it's uh, just as a <laughs> as an investor and like as a person of the craft, it's always helpful to understand how other people look at these things. And then I think as as many um, particularly early stage startups, you, you got to merchandise these three things somehow. Maybe not to you, but maybe to another investor. And so, what are the tells? Um, yep. So first talk about, uh, you know, product founder fit. Um, it'd be different if this was, you know, pick your mainstream tech field. I mean, you're, you're going after frontier stuff. Um, and so how do you, how do you validate frontier creds? Um, maybe, maybe this is an obvious question, but it strikes me that you're, you're kind of going into some, some uncharted waters here. Yeah. So part of it, uh, this is honestly where part of it comes down to relying on my LP group. Uh, so my LP base, you know, I'm a small fund, uh, so about $10 million focused on pre-seed. So my check sizes are relatively small. Uh, the LP base is relatively diverse. The LPs as well are made up of a mafia of more entrepreneurs and operators themselves. Uh, so to some extent, I dive into the technology myself and then I bring in the right technical experts from within my LP base or within my network to assist in actually validating the technical chops of a particular founder. So that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is looking at the EQ fit or the EQ combination of that because it's very easy as a technical subject matter expert. You know, I'm sure we've all talked to PhDs at certain points that uh, are over-indexed on IQ to the detriment of their ability to work with others or their ability to kind of take hits and keep on going. Uh, and I've experienced this specifically at the, the satellite company uh, that I ran. So there, our big focus was on kind of this right balance of IQ, EQ, and passion. And that's really where a lot of this came from. It came from interviewing literally thousands of engineers to try and define kind of the right characteristics for the type of people that we would bring on board to the company. And through talking to more and more founders, I kind of found that at least when you're talking about technical expertise, you can kind of look at that uh, balanced spectrum and use a rubric of sorts to evaluate. The technical chops is almost more, um, it's easier to define or to scope to some extent. The EQ and the personal balance is a little bit harder. And that's where a lot of kind of this experience having interviewed so many engineers and having built out kind of that uh, rubric of sorts actually helps. So it, for me, it becomes more of a sifting challenge and actually kind of uh, sifting through the deals and opportunities that come my way to look for that piece of it almost more than just, is this technically interesting and compelling? Yeah, uh, and, and just to be fair, Chris, you've, you've shared your rubric and it's not a conceptual rubric, it's a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> well, uh, that, that's a spreadsheet of questions. That's not a rubric. Of questions, <laughs> yes. but, um, but, but maybe share kind of uh, without giving up your secret sauce, you know, maybe three of the, you know, particularly the AQ and the EQ is just really tough to, to vet, particularly in a sheltered in place world. And like, yep. talk, talk a little bit more about how you vet those, those two elements. Yeah. Um, Honestly, the AQ and EQ, this is probably where, uh, you know, you hear venture talked about a lot as part science, part art. This is a little more, I guess, art in the sense that it takes a lot of uh, going through the process or having had, you know, thousands of interviews to talk to founders to potentially get to a place where you can kind of uh, suss out where they fall on the spectrum. And then to some extent, in the back of my head, I'm always bound balancing 
where a particular founder falls on a spectrum of what I consider the average of all engineering talent that I've interviewed in the entirety of my career uh, and trying to on balance, look at kind of where they, they sit in that spectrum. Um, for EQ, again, one of the good proxies that I've found is putting them on the phone with a potential customer. Uh, so seeing how they interact with other people other than yourself uh, how they tell the story in a different light to a different type of customer, because fundamentally at the end of the day, what we're talking about is uh, your ability to serve your customers as a founder. Uh, everyone is your customer, whether it's your investor, your actual customers, your team, your co-founders, you are always trying to serve someone. Uh, and so to some extent, the more people that you can kind of suss out how they serve that particular customer, the better. So if you can get two founders sitting down together, have a conversation with them, you can suss out some of the interpersonal dynamics there. If you can put them on the phone with a customer, you can suss out a little bit more about how they will actually uh, sell their product, how they will work through kind of the iteration process of product development, because having a technical innovation isn't a product so much as it is a piece of technology that then needs to be packaged into something that serves a particular need uh, or putting it in from an, uh, another investor. Uh, so I heard a good suggestion today actually of someone who is another emerging manager. In their process, they go through uh, actually getting onto a conference call with a number of emerging managers and having the founder pitch them at one time. That way they get kind of the a uh, balanced view of having other people with varying perspectives and insights asking questions of the founder at the same time. The founder gets to short circuit their overall fundraising cycle. And at the end of the day, you get to make a more informed decision based on how downstream funding may play in as a potential risk or non-risk. And then the AQ piece of it is really, uh, to some extent, you need to look at how many times a founder has failed. Uh, I really like to delve into uh, their past history of failures and or accomplishments, and then the way in which they talk about those, which is informative as well, uh, specifically to the EQ piece of it. So are they taking ownership and responsibility for the failures that they've had, or are they passing those off to uh, things that are external to their own locus of control? Yeah, I, I think particularly you know, in, in this context of um, EHF, I think that the thing I really like about some of your heuristics are a lot of them can be done across borders. They can be done digitally. Um, there are some specific credentialing that are more community-based, right? Like probably product founder fit and a little bit of the referencing on the AQ. Um, maybe that is a segue. Um, what's your experience been like in terms of investing across borders and specifically investing in, in the New Zealand community? Uh, so far, it's been pretty plug and play. So I haven't had, well, there are a couple of things going on here. One, I think that as a first time fund manager at a, in a small fund, uh, I don't have the same kind of uh, ingrained processes or just process that you would have with a, a larger or later stage fund. Uh, so my willingness to kind of break bounds and try new things uh, has always been there. Uh, for me, I started the fund about a year ago, so it hasn't been that long that I've been operating without COVID, let alone with COVID. Uh, so being able to hop on a Zoom call and just have a conversation with somebody uh, hasn't really been a detriment at all. I think the more interesting thing perhaps is the uh, loss of serendipity. So. I think specifically more on like the top of funnel, thinking about deal flow and opportunity, uh, you lose out on some of that access to just what's happening when you're at a meetup with someone or a number of people who have varying perspectives, odd jobs or whatever the case may be, and things will just pop up. Uh, so for me, it's you know, in part being on conversations like this where certain things come from, but honestly, that's probably the biggest detriment, whereas the uh, ability to find opportunities has been strong uh, for whatever reason. It seems like everybody is fundraising, uh, including folks who uh, have been sitting at home and realized that now is the best time to start a new company. So not only people who had companies before, but then also people who just are uh, ready for a change. Uh, so that's been relatively easy. It's 
the conversion is relatively easy getting from kind of initial conversation to then more technical diligence uh, and diving in with the, the rest of the team and potential references. And then even getting to conversion, I mean, I'd say it's what Q2, well, funny enough, Q1, I did no deals. Uh, and it wasn't because of COVID. Uh, it was just, I didn't see anything compelling uh, that felt like it was priced appropriately and had kind of the right conviction around the opportunity with founder technology fit. Uh, Q2, I did four deals. Uh, so all of a sudden Q2 came back and full lockdown ended up doing four deals, including one that was an incubation uh, with a former colleague of mine. And then Q3 come back, I did one deal. Uh, so it's kind of this on balance, it kind of measured out over time, but you definitely see these uh, peaks and valleys. And I don't know that it's COVID specific so much as it's just uh, perhaps opportunity or, yeah, I'll stop there. And, yeah, no, it's um, maybe I'll ask you a question and I think it's a good time to open it up actually, because I think this topic is probably relevant to both. Um, the entrepreneurs and, and the, the investors in the group. Um, as you think about that serendipity and that top of funnel um, being shut down because of in per lack of in-person um, events and catalysts, how are you thinking about supplementing it digitally, right? Part of it's these, these Zoom calls and are, are there other, are there other ways and that, that entrepreneurs can access to, to get, on your, get on your radar and investors' radars generically? Uh, yes. I mean, for me specifically, I have two things that I'm thinking about right now. And, uh, you know, if people have strong opinions one way or the other, I'd, I'd love to hear those because uh, these are ideas in my head that I've spoken about with maybe two people. Uh, one is given that I'm the tip of the spear for a lot of deep tech things and a lot of the investments that I make are into technical innovations. Uh, there's inherently a lot of connection to universities and governments and uh, different institutions. Uh, so one thought has been to create almost a Midas list of researchers uh, and put that out as a way to look at university laboratories and otherwise where there's great innovation happening uh, and new companies being spun out. So it's not just innovation in a vacuum, but it's true innovation that's getting out to the world. Uh, and I think that that could be one potential avenue to open the funnel a little bit. And then at the same point, kind of create something that has uh, value for others as well as value back to atypical and drawing in potential founders. And then the, the second is just as a product of my past life selling uh, enterprise IT solutions, I love cold emails. Uh, I, I love when people send me a really good cold email. I really hate it when people send me a really bad cold email. Uh, and I will tell them when it's a bad cold email. Uh, so I have a, a post queued up for a, a blog just talking about uh, cold emailing, frankly. Uh, I think that it's an underappreciated art. And when we think about kind of getting outside of the box and specifically outside of kind of the uh, people we already know, so looking for innovators in places that you wouldn't normally look, uh, they don't always have access to the same investors and opportunities that some folks in the Bay Area or New York or Auckland even have. Uh, so I'm planning to put something out on cold emailing me and specifically looking for people outside of kind of the normal spaces. Um, let's take a moment. Are there any questions from the, the group? Um, Kirsty, you guys can just weigh in, just uh, un unmute and jump in if you're, if you're ready. Oh. Uh, Chris, great to hear your story and your journey. Um, and I see that you're from one of the very early cohort too. Um, I'm a, an investor in level two. Are you aware of level two here in New Zealand and, and which is effectively the birthplace of Lanza Tech and also some really deep tech, other deep tech businesses like Avatana, Mint Innovation, uh, Dotrel, and these businesses are all repurposing things like waste or in the case of doctoral, it's around reducing the sound noise to do with, um, uh, you know, those flying objects that are ultimately going to deliver parcels. And um, my point here is that I think we've got, th there's another organization called KiwiNet, which is commercializing or helping to commercialize research out of the universities. 
And I just think it would be really great to get you, you know, more integrated into some of the deep tech type work that is being done here in New Zealand, because there might be some synergies whereby you have an area of expertise or you know people uh, that might be able to add value. And I just wonder how well are we doing that as an EHF cohort to try and create those, um, you, you know, those relationships and those connections? I, I mean, for one, I think that'd be great uh, to get more closely connected to those. I'm connected to, as of right now, Ice House and a couple other groups through, uh, I mean, even like Peter at Rocket Labs. Um, I think we were their first customer on their test flight. Uh, so I have some connection there and that's kind of netted some opportunities. Uh, but yeah, anything to get more connected into the New Zealand ecosystem and specifically some of the research institutions and otherwise would be fantastic. Thank you. I think you're, you're about to ask something, but. Yeah, just, you know, I'm just letting your comment uh, which I, I found interesting on the cold outreach. Um, uh, it, that goes two ways. So, you know, taking off my entrepreneur hat, putting on my YC hat for a second. Uh, the, some of the companies that uh, we enjoyed working with the most in my groups were, were the ones that actually we reached out to, that we cold called them. Like I would read an article in Science or in yep. Chemistry Magazine. Like, wow, this is really, I, I really like what you guys are doing. And the, the the labs or the people that were in the Midas list, as you put it, of the top uh, innovative labs are actually some of the worst responders to those. Whereas when you reach out and this you know, this speaks a little bit to uh, the New Zealand ecosystem, but also you know, parts of America and other parts of the world as well. If you reach out to somebody in the Midwest, or you reach out to somebody in a, that, at a place that's not Oxford in the UK, you say, I really enjoyed your paper. Have you thought about turning this into a company? That ha That's had uh, a pretty high success rate um, uh, for, in the, I, I focus on biotech, right? So it, for me, I'm curious yep. in the space of engineering, how that's gone, if you've done that as well. Uh, I have, so my second largest source of deal flow is outbound. Uh, and like you, I read IEEE and phys.org and a number of other publications and have actively invested in companies that I have myself cold outreach to uh, in order to get that initial conversation going. I, I completely agree with you too. I think that the uh, quality of quality uh, of the company and the opportunity is not by... Uh, is it usually oftentimes inversely correlated with one's ability to market themselves. Uh, and so I have found a number of opportunities that are quite compelling and interesting uh, where the founders don't have the immediate ability to market themselves, uh, which is part of the value that I then wanna bring back to that company. Uh, so if they have the right balance of IQ and EQ uh, and can learn, so they're effectively learning machines, it's easier to get them on board with the idea that they can effectively pitch something uh, and to run them through enough practice sessions that they get to a place where suddenly they are an all-star pitcher uh, as opposed to just you know an all-star technology. I don't want to say just because it's not just. Like pitching is its own kind of trait, but fundamentally it doesn't correlate directly with the quality of the atomic metrics of the company itself. I would say that I would extend that even to the later stage, which is um, you know, most investors are idea people. Um, and so if, even if you're based outside the hubs, even if you don't have any um, uh, overlapping networks to reference you, um, ideas travel incredibly well uh, and it's a big matching problem. And so um, it's all discoverable. Uh, it's all discoverable in terms of investors that are interested in your field. And it's it's um, it's not impossible, to, irregardless of what your background is, where you're based, um, to to get your get into the idea flow. And and yeah, I would say that I, I, I tracked this once over a three year period. I, I want to say I looked at 170 companies. I invested in two, and uh, the two companies were specific companies that I chased. Right, and and so I think 
I think that's a common theme across. And so just as a, just to extend the point, um, with the great point that Gary made. Um, it's also you, actually just uh, extending on that for one second. It's also interesting how, how much technical innovation, uh, fails to cross the chasm because of referencing. I think referencing is another important characteristic here uh, where if you have something that's truly innovative and unique, uh, you then go take it to an investor who, as David mentioned, is an idea person. Uh, they will then go to their network. Now their network is ingrained in another way of thinking uh, that is almost immediately biased against whatever it is you're doing so unless you can short circuit that referencing process by bringing people to the fray who understand what it is you're doing, why it's different, why it's better, why it's important and they need to fund it, you're almost at a disadvantage from the get go because that investor has to rely on their own network to kind of help to vet what it is you're doing. Can you expand, can you can I ask one more question? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, please, please. Can you expand on that? Because that that's true at both ends of the spectrum. It's at both of the very innovative things, and if you're doing something which is very hot, right? So the their signal to noise in one space versus I can't recognize this as signal or noise in the other space. How do you short circuit? Yeah. I mean, the things that are very hot they tend to be very hot because people focus on social proof, and the social proof tends to pop up in places that uh, have to do with who's using something, not necessarily why they're using something. Uh, I, I think the kind of clarification here that I'm trying to make is more on if you have something that's a truly innovative piece of technology, you need to find technical experts who understand the technical nuance of what it is you're doing and can explain that nuance to investors who themselves then need to turn around and explain it to their partnership. And so unless you can break it down into terms that make sense for not only the one investor, the partner that you're talking to, but also that partner to then sell it to the rest of the partnership, you're at a disadvantage. So in a couple of cases, I've suggested to my founders that they identify either potential customers within the portfolio of that investor that they want to talk to, get those folks on board with using this as a potential product because that short circuits the referencing process, or to identify technical experts in the field that they can provide as a upfront reference sheet uh, that look and feel like third party independent folks as opposed to people that are maybe working at your company right now and would just kind of spout the same things that you are. Does that provide some clarity there? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd maybe broaden the point uh, um, it, you know, specific to this, this community, which is um, uh, the more the more personal interactions over a long period of time, I think, uh, help to get people over the hump. And that that may not be useful from an early stage context, but um, I think the the more comp, you know common touch points, you come back and you do what you say you're going to do builds conviction over time. And so for us, again, when I look back at the data, the the average the, the company the average company I've invested in, I've known for three years prior to investing, and that doesn't. It doesn't do wonders for early stage companies, but then when you want to scale, I think there is a there is a huge value to engaging on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be frequent, and there's a credibility that is created. Um, and so, um, historical results don't they predict the future results, but they but they sure build a lot of confidence. And so, as you think about it, right? I would I think I'll first secure initial money, you know keep the lights on, but then as you think about pick, you know, two, three, four investors that are in your field that are one stage down to start building up a, a peer level relationship um, that you're not asking it from for anything other than sharing your view of the world and the market and the business model. And, and um, you know, you, you, you start building credibility um, over time. Um, what else uh, can, can we ask Chris, given that in many ways, you know, he is the, if you're an early stage entrepreneur, he's the target, right? He's, he's he wants to invest in New Zealand. Um, he's looking to take uh, uh, big risk on great founders um, in really interesting markets. Yeah, I've got one for Chris. Um, Chris, have you, in the light of the current um, environment where travel is, you know, pretty hard to do? 
Um, have you or would you invest in companies um, without actually physically meeting the founders and the team, i.e. doing it all virtually? Yep, have done it. Uh, I Let's see, in Q4, I invested into a company in the UK uh, that I've never met personally, uh, or physically, I should say. Uh, we've had a number of Zoom conversations. Uh, I did the same thing in Q3 with a company in Idaho, uh, and I've talked to actually a couple of companies in New Zealand uh, throughout the lockdown. Great to hear. Well, well Chris, I was going to ask you about your anti-portfolio, but uh, it's, it sounds like it's been a, a year or so in, um, and so it's, it's, it's hard to know what the anti-portfolio is um, yet, but um, Maybe take let's take it. You know, maybe we can end on a uh, on a different note, which is like, what's the craziest idea or craziest entrepreneur you invested in? Just given it sounds like you're on the on the frontier. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing too is I definitely have an anti portfolio. Uh, in my case, most of it relates back to when I uh, was deploying time instead of capital. Uh, so I spent time with Intercom when they were five people. Uh, and worked with Owen and Dez uh, very early on for kind of customer market development. Uh, I spent a little bit of time talking to Stripe uh, early on. I think they, at that point they were still like a hundred million dollar company or something like that. Um, and then I ended up putting my wife uh, to work at Instacart. Uh, so I, I knew the three founders there uh, personally for quite some time. Uh, those are all random though i think the closest one to kind of the portfolio would be stripe uh just in terms of what they're doing and kind of the idea of primitives um craziest idea i've invested in so far it kind of depends on your definition of crazy uh the craziest technological uh thing that i've invested in is a nuclear reactor focused on radioisotopes for uh, medical imaging uh, and medical purposes um that was in Q3, so that's recent. Uh, I mean, I invested into a biotech company that uh, focuses on programmable chemistry and biology. So they create uh, effectively temporary tattoos that change as your health does. Wow, very cool, awesome. All right, well, well with that, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for everybody joining. And, uh, and Chris, you know, thanks for being generous with your thoughts and your time. and and your story. So I uh, really appreciate it. And if anyone wants to get in touch with Chris, um, he can put his email address there in the chat. And you can also search for the, the fellows, investor fellows on the website, the ehf.org under the fellows directory there. And um, if any of you investor fellows want to be next up um, in February or March, April, May for a conversation with the New Zealand ecosystem, just ping me and we'll get it sorted. And maybe come with your person that you want to be the interviewer. Be great. Or I can match you up. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>